Um, all right, let me agree to the recording. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Danny Brecker Cook. I'm the Associate University Librarian for Learning and User Experience at the UC San Diego Library. Um, I will explain a little bit more about what that really long title means in just a minute. Um, I just want to echo what uh, I heard from Christina about those co-curricular opportunities while you're in library school and how valuable they can, get, can be to get practical experience um, that when you're going on the job market, you'll be able to speak to specific projects you worked on. So that's so cool that you all have a group related to user experience, and I definitely recommend that you all get involved in it. So um, very cool. I have some slides too. Um, and I'm here to talk about the user experience side of academic libraries. Um, so I met Lauren through uh, the UC San Diego Librarians Association mentoring program. So every year we have um, an opportunity for library school students to get matched with librarians in our library and have kind of informational interviews. So definitely do look for that next year if you're interested. Um, I would say most of our librarians do participate in it, ranging from folks who do user experience work to subject librarians. So whatever you're interested in, it's a great program. Um, so let me share with you a little bit about my background. Um, so as I mentioned, I am the Associate University Librarian for Learning and User Experience. So um, I'm a library administrator, um, and the groups that I work with in the library are our Spaces Lending and Access team, which includes circulation and uh, engagement, assessment, um, of course, spaces, um, things of that nature. Our uh, academic engagement and learning services team, yep, got that right, um, which is mostly subject specialists. So the librarians who go and work with departments and teach classes to students, work at our reference desk, things of that nature. And then technology and digital experience, which combines a kind of traditional IT department with a development shop with user experience. Um, so it's kind of an unusual portfolio of things to put together, but it all is kind of circling around that idea of user experience. And what does it mean to have a great user experience in the library and have a cohesive user experience as you engage with the library, whether you're a student or a faculty member or a member of the public? My background, um, previously, I worked as the director of the teaching and learning department at the UC Riverside Library, and then um, I started as an instructional design librarian at the Claremont College's library, and I went back and looked, and I think I had like four different titles while I was there. So that's the one that I think is most relevant and important um, related to user experience. So um, I've been doing UX-related work since I was in library school as well, um, with some of those co-curricular opportunities. Um, and it is a field that has changed dramatically in the past 10 years um, since I was in library school. Um, I'm also the co-founder of the Conference on Academic Library Management. Um, that's a area of librarianship that I feel passionately about and happy to talk about that as well. Um, and yeah, my background is in teaching. I think that that's uh, how I see user experience and management. That's the lens I see everything through, um, but uh, very related fields, I would say, um, although perhaps not at first glance. Um, so I do have some slides, like I mentioned, to share with you today about kind of the way we might think about user experience in academic libraries today, but like feel free to stop me if you have questions or comments or things you want to share either in the chat or raise your hand, any of those things are good. Um, so let's talk about what does user experience mean? I think you all know this already because you're here with that interest and you're involved in this amazing co-curricular group. Um, so from the Nielsen Norman group though, the concept of user experience is now considered to be all aspects of a person's interaction with a company, its services, and its products. Back in the day when I started, um, UX really referred primarily to interactions on the internet. Um, so digital experiences, early UX roles were all about navigating websites, optimizing searches, um, things of that nature. And so they came up with another word, another term um, of customer experience. Um, which when you read this definition, customer experience has been used to describe the totality of interactions that a user has with an organization over time, basically means the same thing at this point. Um, so those are interchangeable terms, but I might be using today, I prefer to use user experience because in libraries, we don't have customers, right? Like we're not exchanging any money for services, which is what makes libraries amazing. Um, but there used to be this divide between user experience being digital related, um, experiences and customer experience being everything else. Um, and that really doesn't exist anymore. And that's a pretty recent change, I would say. And I would um, 
say that now everything is user experience. So in the library, everything is user experience. Everything comes back to how do we interact with the people who use our services, who use our collections, kind of having a user experience lens on all of the things that an academic library does sets us up to be successful and meet the needs of our communities. And I'm gonna talk about um, some more specific examples in a little bit. Um, so when I was asked to speak about the user experience side of academic libraries, I thought about it and I was like, you know what? I think it's everything. Um, so I just wanna, again, uh, go back and show how much this field has changed in the past 10 years. Um, so the first journal of user experience in academic libraries started in 2014. It's called Weave the Journal of User Experience. Um, and if you look at the table of contents here, um, you can see that everything is about the website, right? So apps, um, dialogue boxes, the homepage, et cetera. And then in its most recent issue, A, it looks a lot, uh, it looks a lot cooler. Um, so web design has gone better, but um, it's really about physical spaces um, in addition to things like uh, library research guides. So combining those two experiences, thinking about the digital and the physical spaces as a holistic whole that encompasses the library in totality. Um, and that's been a big change, I think, for people to think about. And sometimes when we talk about user experience, I think that conversation, like especially in school, hasn't caught up to the idea that really it is all the spaces. So uh, here's an incomplete list of all the things that affect the user experience in the academic library. Um, just to give a sense of how um, much this kind of mindset can Im impact the work of a library. So I think we'll start with the basic one, right? I think everybody would think of this when we talk about user experience in libraries, which is like, how does the library search um, operate? How does the discovery layer operate? Um, that's where a lot of early user experience work in libraries began. Um, looking at how people conduct their searches, lots of journey mapping, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, and making incremental improvements um, so that people can find the things that they're looking for more easily. Um, but also in the physical space, interactions at service points. So what does it feel like when you come into the library and you talk to somebody at the circulation desk or the front desk or the reference desk or um, wherever you go? Um, that affects how people will interact with the library moving forward. Are they gonna come back? Um, so understanding how um, people engage in those moments is important for us to be considering as we design those services. Um, going back to the website, being able to find things on the library website. If you go to the UC San Diego website, it's still a little bit challenging to find some things on that website. We have a whole team now that's devoted to making that better and we are making things better incrementally. Um, Having subject headings that match user behavior. So thinking about the terms that people actually use to search for things and matching them to what you use to describe those objects so that people can actually find them. The only way to learn that is by engaging in user experience kind of research um, to understand the way that people think and, and describe things. Being able to navigate the physical library space, signage, um, can you find your way around? What are those pain points um, for people who come into this space? It's a big piece of our spaces lending and access program um, at the library that I work at now. Um, for example, uh, we got rid of most of our signage when we did a recent renovation. Now nobody can find the elevator. Um, we are having a significant new project to redo all the signage and create signage so that people um, can find these things that have become pain points. Um, the length of checkout periods, again, understanding how people actually use the materials that come from the library. How current are the collections? Do they match the things that people are actually researching now? Is, does it match the agendas of faculty? Does it match the courses that are being offered to students? Um, all of those things we can't understand without doing some research into what those folks are actually doing. Um, the cleanliness, right? Um, if you go into a dirty library, terrible experience. You go into a cluttered website, it's a terrible experience. Um, you may not want to come back and avail yourself of all those resources. Um, and yeah, again, the ability to navigate the website. Um, so these are just a few examples of the kinds of things that we can look at through the user experience lens um, in academic libraries. But I think I'm pretty hard pressed to think of anything that would not be enhanced um, by doing user experience research of some kind. Um, 
because everything we do ultimately has an impact on the user, whether that's, again, cataloging or that kind of um, more obvious public services work. Okay, so then I started to think about, like, how do we learn about our users? And so I can give you some examples of the kinds of projects um, where user experience methods really come to bear. Um, so interviews, I think, is a really basic one, um, whether that's starting with stakeholder interviews within the library itself um, for projects that maybe are um, more, begin as more internally facing, I would say. So recently we redesigned our um, get help infrastructure on the library website, and we started by doing stakeholder interviews with the people who provide that service. Um, what are the things that they thought were important? And then we went to students, faculty, and staff to talk with them about um, what are the things that they're looking for? Um, what are the things that they're valuing? And we actually did, of course, find some mismatches between things that librarians thought were the most important about that page and what students really wanted from that page. Um, Recently, we also did a big project about open educational resources and affordable course materials at the UC San Diego campus. Um, we met with faculty to talk with them about their experiences and how they assign course materials. Why are they choosing the things that they're, um, they're using in their courses? Are they considering the cost at all? Why or why not? What are the things that they've heard about open educational resources? Um, what are the things that are stopping them from using them or creating them? And like, of course, the answer is always money, right? Um, but that really helped us to form a plan um, for how we can support that kind of work going forward. Um, and that wouldn't be possible without understanding where our users are coming from and what are the opportunities and challenges that they face every day. Um, so that's, I think, a really basic one. Um, but of course, a good interview takes practice. So again, your user experience group um, is a great place to maybe get some of that practice. Okay, journey maps, I mentioned a little bit before. So um, they can be as simple as um, just like, how do you get from point A to point B? You walk into the library and you're, you wanna check out a book from the hold shelf. What are all the things that you need to do um, in order to get from point A to point B? Um, this is an example from a recent library journal article, um, which also talks about the feelings that are associated with all of those things. Um, so this is a person who's coming into the library and they want to sign up for a library card. And so um, the things that are not awesome, right? They have to first find the library, then they have to park, they have to get there. Um, they maybe don't know that library cards are free, et cetera. And then finally, once they interact with the library, hopefully they move into that more positive feeling so that again, they understand that the library is there for them. Um, so journey maps are really important for us in the academic library of understanding, like where are those moments that people quit, right? Um, I think you probably take in information seeking behavior type courses and there's that concept of satisficing, right? Like people will do the thing that is going to meet the bare minimum and is easiest, especially if there's friction. So can we identify those points where there's friction for people? Um, Hopefully you don't have to connect to a VPN in order to get to your library resources at San Jose. Um, we do, that is a big friction point for us um, and something that we are actively working on because that's the moment that people really do feel that pain um, when they're trying to access library resources. Uh, empathy maps are um, another really awesome tool um, to think about what are the things that drive people. Um, so this is a, um, a sample of what an empathy map kind of uh, might look like. And I'll give you an actual example in just a moment. And this is kind of surrounding the idea of like um, how you might use empathy to think about learners, but it could be adapted to, of course, any kind of function within the library. Um, so first identifying who are your users, what are their goals, what are the things that they actually have to do in order to reach their goals? Are there certain constraints? Um, are there things going on around them, right? Um, so sometimes when we design services, uh, we need to be aware of the things that are happening on our campus. Um, I think the most impactful example of this recently, of course, was COVID, right? Um, so when we're thinking about the contextual factors, people were more stressed. People maybe didn't have um, reliable internet. Uh, their internet was slower than it might've been if, it was, if they were on campus. Maybe they had 
people in the background, um, like I do right now. Um, all those different pieces um, that can impact the way that people interact with the library um, and our services. So here's an example. Oh, no, I didn't mean to click on that. Um, all right. Um, so here is um, a map that kind of lays out an instructional problem. So some students in a uh, ecology class and who they are, and some of them have had library instruction and some of them haven't. Um, other questions that we might have about them that would help us frame whatever our solution would be for these students. Um, like how many of them are transfer students? Um, have they had writing classes before? Have they had any classes that they were required to do research in before? Some of those things we can kind of imagine um, by putting ourselves in their shoes and some of those things we would actually have to go out and find. Um, and then looking at what their goals are. Of course, they want to and not to be terrible, right? Um, they want to have a good experience working together. They want to get a good grade. Um, what are those things that are driving them? And then what are those interventions that we can do to help them achieve that? Uh, another one I think that everybody is probably very, very familiar with is surveys. We do a ton of surveys in academic libraries, potentially too many surveys. Um, I bet you all get a bunch of surveys all the time too. Um, and one of the challenges with surveys is that they're very easy to put together, but they're really hard to do well. Um, so you have to um, get people at that moment where they're actually thinking about the thing that you want to ask them about, that they're invested, um, that it's clear, working backwards from the um, kind of information that you're hoping to get to design the questions. Um, again, recently on this affordable course materials project, we did a large scale survey of the student body um, to understand more about how much they spent on course materials, were they actually buying the materials um, that were assigned in class, if they weren't, how were they accessing course materials, and there was a huge range, um, and this um, turned out to be something that a lot of people cared about. We had a really good response rate on this survey. Like, wildly different than the surveys that we often um, field from the library where we might get a few hundred uh, responses if we're lucky. Um, this was in the thousands. Um, and part of that, again, was asking the right questions and having the right framing for that survey so that people wanted to engage. So survey design is kind of its own um, field. And uh, if that's something that you can learn more about while you're in school, I think that will serve you super, super well. Um, all right, and here's just a real simple survey. Um, so you probably have taken these surveys before um, in places like the Apple Store or like every online retailer now. Like as you finish your purchase, how likely are you to recommend this to someone else? We implemented it um, in our library instruction sessions because when we had a long survey, nobody filled it out and we had no idea about anything. And we decided that really the most important thing was just to get a sense of the pulse, like, did people find it useful? And this gave us good information and identify those places and those courses where we wanted to dig in deeper and understand more about what was happening in those courses. Okay, so you have all this information about your users, you go out and you talk to them, you survey them, you observe them perhaps, and then what do you do with that information? Um, so prototyping is something that we do a lot of in academic libraries, ideally, right? Um, which is coming up with a bunch of different ideas that might work. Um, and that can be as um, like low difficulty as a drawing like this, right? Like my problem is that I want students to use Boolean operators and what are the different ways that I might do that? Here are some really awesome pictures that I drew. Um, but um, it could be as complicated as putting together wireframes or um, like uh, visuals of a library website or um, a service that is pretty much true to life that then you take and get feedback on from your various stakeholders. Um, so academic libraries are highly political places, I would say, in terms of everybody has a strong opinion about what the library should be doing. Um, so buy-in is a huge part of any library project. Make sure you talk to everybody. And a big piece of that is taking these prototypes that we've created, iterating them, going back to our stakeholders, and making sure 
that we've um, met their needs. Um, I think a big change in academic libraries is, I think you'll be shocked to hear this, but many librarians are perfectionists. Um, and uh, we, move, we live in a time where we can't really aim for perfection all the time, like nothing will ever get done. So we're working more in an iterative way. Um, so we'll do like one change and then we'll keep working on it, right? Um, which is the way that our society tends to work now. Um, and uh, kind of taking each step and asking our users how that's working for them. Um, and that's just been a different way of, of working and a different way of thinking for people. So I, I do think that's been a big kind of cultural change in the last few years um, in academic libraries. All right, so again, I uh, have a couple examples of some prototypes here. This is just a poster about a project that we worked on um, where we did a bunch of user experience work to design a tutorial. And we have some really lo-fi um, prototyping here, like um, the, the student that I worked with on this project drew things by hand to actually building it out and then getting feedback. Okay, then once you've done all that, um, how do you gather that feedback? So one of the strategies that I really like, um, that I've used a lot of many, many times at this point, um, and I learned about from my colleague Doug Worsham is called I Like, I Wish, What If? Um, we use it all the time um, to get feedback from students, but also to give feedback to each other. Um, so here is a prototype. Sometimes people don't know how to give feedback and this gives them a framework for doing so. So maybe I like the cute little animals that you made um, on this new Ask Us page. We have raccoons on the page. I do like that. Um, I wish that it was shorter, perhaps. Um, and then like, what's my wild and crazy idea? Like, what would make this so much better? What if you got rid of the VPN? Um, something like that. Um, and so we ask students and faculty to give us feedback in this format frequently because it's often actionable, um, something that we can actually do. So we have a library student advisory group um, and we convene it every year, they meet monthly. And the way we start our library student advisory group every year is with this exercise. And I think on my next slide, yeah, here's a couple of examples of the kinds of things that they liked. Um, so they like the cafe, they like the chargers. And then when we got to the I wish, um, things that have come from that I wish um, that we've actually been able to put into practice was expanding overnight study, being able to take like dining dollars at the cafe, having additional chargers, um, different kinds of furniture, et cetera. So um, it's a way of helping people to prioritize what they really like, but also uh, making sure that they're not just giving you feedback on like what they don't like, which is very much the human tendency, right? We have a negativity bias that's just kind of like ingrained in us. Um, so how do we learn about some of the things that people do appreciate so we, that we can learn from those things? All right, and then of course, um, analytics. So again, that could be in a physical or a digital space. Um, here's just a real simple chart where we looked at the number of resources in a research guide and the amount of time that people actually spent in the guide. And um, again, maybe not shockingly, the more resources that were in the guide, the less time people spent in the guide. It gives us good information about how people are using research guides. They want things that are going to point them um, to a uh, specific source rather than having to sift through a bazillion things, right? Like they have Google, they don't need the librarian to be Google for them. Um, they're looking for specifics. Um, so it can be getting that kind of basic data on how long people stay on a website, for example. Um, it could be looking at the library website and looking at it over time. Um, so what are the um, times that more people are using it? correlate those to some changes that we made, um, looking at things of that nature, and you can get more and more data at this point um, out of websites, including like accessibility data. You can see where people are clicking, where people are hovering their mouse, mouse even. So there's just so much data to sift through and being able to parse data is a really in-demand skill um, in academic libraries, as well as in user experience roles um, in private industry as well. Um, of course, analytics also extend to the physical space, like where are people sitting and when. Um, let me see if I, I thought I put a slide there, but I didn't. Um, so we know that during finals, the whole library is filled um, and we can either count the people in those seats or we can use tools like 
um, Bluetooth signal counters to approximate the number of people in the library. Um, and that tells us, again, like, do we not have enough seats in the library? Where are the kinds of places that people like to study? Um, so interpreting that data uh, is an important and um, growing skill set. So I was thinking about like, what are the courses I wish that I um, would have had to prepare for user experience kinds of work in academic libraries or elsewhere. Um, and I took a look at your course catalog. And so of course, I think your um, coursework in academic libraries, of course, would be relevant. Um, but also things uh, along the lines of instructional design. Um, many of the tools that we use in instructional design are very similar, if not exactly the same as user experience tools. Um, because you're thinking about how do people learn or how do people engage with things, and it's really about um, empathic design. In the end, I think that's kind of the underlying commonality, and so the tools that work well in one do work well in the other. Thinking about library services for racially and ethnically diverse communities, um, so how do we think about the differences between the different demographic groups on our campuses? How do we provide outreach to them differently? Um, are there different strategies that we should be using? Um, are there different things that we should be aware of when we design surveys um, so that we can be respectful of people of all kinds of backgrounds? Um, marketing, very closely tied to user experience. And again, interpersonal communication, thinking about those surveys, talking to people in order to get your data to do your user experience work really is about talking to other people. Um, and then I didn't see specific courses on these necessarily, but perhaps if you have the opportunity to take electives outside of um, the ones that are available on the website, any courses that you might be able to take on evaluation and assessment, like data courses, instructional design, or research methods, all of those will come in super handy in doing user experience kind of work. And yeah, I think that is what I have to share, um, but I'd be glad to answer any questions that y'all have or um, hear about your experiences, whatever sounds good to you. Awesome. Um, I actually took a UX course uh, before that. I, I think it was one of the, you know, how some of the courses have a number and then there are like multiple section options for it. So um, that's where, nice. Um, I learned about, you know, like the difference between online and like to begin to think about the in-person experience and all of like all of like from the moment you get arrive at the library or like, you know, even at the parking lot to like all of those different parts of it. Um, we also had to do a sort of audit experience where we had family or friends use a library website and monitor their like journey using it mm, uh -huh. and um and yeah it was very interesting to to see that experience like that was a public library experience and i i know that that's um at least that's different because one of the, the complaints or, or things that i noticed just using public library stuff like online is that often the city or county isn't like has control over the website right and and so that is already you know it's already going to be different like they don't get to control how it looks how it, like the font might be too small because it just fits with everything else on the website right. or or just certain little uh, maybe accessibility things that haven't been adjusted yet on the general website um but being in a university um i imagine there's at least some more control maybe over some of um, how that looks for you or how, yeah. that, how that works. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I just visited the San Diego Public Library website today and they are working within kind of a framework that all the city, including like, you know, um, waste disposal has the same website, right? They just have different content. Um, and that works not as well for some people as others. And so I definitely know what you're talking about. I'd say academic libraries tend to be able to control their own website, but not always. Um, and so sometimes you'll see um, academic libraries try to get around that by using something like the LibGuides platform as their homepage um, so that they do have at least some more control 
Um, for us, we have to work within the campus content management system, but within that, there's a lot of flexibility. So we have to meet the same brand guidelines, but we can do a lot of um, customization. So that is definitely um, a gift, I think, of working in an academic library is that ability to kind of design that digital experience for folks um, more than some of our public library colleagues. Yeah, okay, so I see a question from Lynn about what the team at UC San Diego looks like. Um, yeah, so we have actually a few different teams that work um, kind of around this area. So our digital experience team is led by a digital experience manager who um, is in a staff classification, um, but used to be a librarian, so has a library background, also in teaching and learning, um, but has made a transition to pretty much solidly user experience work at this point. Um, we have a um, lead for inclusive design who is uh, really creating a lot of the prototypes and doing the on the ground user experience work as well as managing our student team. And she is also a former librarian, also in a staff classification, but has made that transition. Um, so having a library background can be really helpful, especially in navigating some of those difficult relationships between um, the librarians really want it this way and students really want it that way so how do you bridge that gap so having that background is really handy and then we have between five and seven students on our design team um, they work through a design process um, with the two managers um, they actually I can share some of the details with you um, if I can find it I maybe we'll follow up with that um, and uh, they do a lot of the actual design work. So we have a lot of raccoons now on our website because UC San Diego, if you've ever visited, is known for its raccoon population. Um, and they're very cute. Um, and there should be more of them everywhere on uh, UC San Diego websites. And so now there are because the students really care about them. Um, so it's really handy to have students engaged in that design process because that's not something we would have thought of ourselves. Um, and the great thing about working with students is that um, they understand their population, they're part of that population, they have a lot of energy, um, they may have skills that folks who work in the library don't have, but they don't, they can't stay that long, um, but a lot of them do go on to UX jobs outside of um, academia. Um, on the kind of physical side, um, those are also primarily staff roles. Um, it is just a historical reason, I guess. Like there's no reason that it wouldn't be librarians. Um, and we usually don't have any students working on that team. Um, then I think for individual projects, uh, librarians will work with those two teams to go through the user experience process, um, but often don't run that process by themselves. Um, although I think in the future, that would be really cool. Um, okay, so the program, yes, is um, Libra uh, Librarians Association of the University of California, San Diego. So yes, thank you for that link. Um, I have a question. This is Kay. Uh, that's related Hi. to uh, that link uh, about mentorship. Um, mm -hmm. I'm from the LA area. Uh, to who could participate in that uh, mentorship program? Do you have to be a, a UC San Diego student or? Yeah, so the um, kind of pairing in the spring that happens yeah. is um, uh, anyone, anyone who's in library school. So it, you can definitely sign up for that. Um, yeah, there is a mentorship program for folks who join the library who are staff employees or new librarians. Um, but the program that Lauren participated in, that's open to everybody. Uh, Michelle, I see your comment. Oh, yes, you know Sue Wei. Fantastic. Okay, UX evangelism is an important aspect of our ongoing efforts. Do you have any ideas for this challenge? Uh, Michelle, maybe could I ask you to expand on that question a little bit? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, when we were having our discussion, um, some of the problems that seem to be entailed is that a lot of people don't understand exactly what user experience is and what it entails and really how it's at the core of everything that we do within libraries. 
in talking with some representatives from Harvard Library, they they also reiterate that user experience is absolutely at the center of everything we do. Um, so I was just wondering if you have any ideas of how we can start to articulate um, the importance of UX and to help you know our patrons and our stakeholders to get that buy-in and to understand just the 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 magnitude of the importance of these efforts. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. That is a great question. Um, so I think there are a couple of external drivers that I'll talk about. Um, but I think one of the things about librarianship that we are fortunate in some ways and less fortunate than others, right, is that we have a shared sense of mission and purpose. So um, I think people who come into librarianship, like we're often here because we want to serve whatever that community is. Um, and that part of service really speaks to, we need to understand that community and we really need to create experiences that allow that community to engage with all the services that we offer, with all the collections that we offer, that they can use these amazing resources to their full extent. So I think that um, kind of falling back on that thing that we all share, I think is one way into having that conversation about the user experience. Um, I think that the more we do it, right, the more kind of successful projects that we have where we can show exactly what the feedback has been from people, what we've learned about people and how that's translated into changes in library services and library websites, et cetera. Um, and then what the impact of that is, um, is another really important way to engage in that conversation. So how many more people are finding things in their first search than previously? How many more people are engaging with these services that we've redesigned? Um, so uh, I think at every university right now, there's a large conversation about what is the value of the library? Well, the value of the library is determined by the people who use the library, right? Like we can have all the cool stuff in the world and if nobody ever used it, then like, unfortunately, I don't know that libraries would be around that long um, because just the preservation of materials is not like enough to fund all these libraries. Um, so I think being able to attach the outcomes of user experience project, projects and how they meet those needs with the outcomes that universities care about, student success, faculty research success, um, grant dollars that come into the university because maybe people were able to use um, GIS tools that the library provides, things like that. Um, that all, I think, helps build that story of why user experience is important. I don't know if I answered your question, but I hope I got at least close. Uh, thanks. That's really helpful. I also think that as LIS professionals, we're uniquely poised to uh, to reach the challenge of these endeavors and sort of starting with understanding the unique information seeking behaviors of our patrons and uh, understanding even the the idea of satisficing that you talked about of uh, sort of the path of least resistance um so i think that for um lis professionals i i do believe that we you know again are very unique uniquely poised to take on the challenge of user experience so thank you so much danny yeah thanks for that great question i think i'm also a little spoiled like i came into a role that has user experience in the title so i came into a place where they were already saying we value user experience. So um, I know that's not the case for everybody. All right, let's look at the chat. Um, so does UC San Diego have any internship opportunities? Um, occasionally we do, we don't um, currently. Um, yeah, we don't currently have any internship opportunities. We're working on making sure that those internship opportunities could be paid. Um, historically, they have not been, they need to be. Um, so right now we, we don't have those opportunities, but yeah, um, I'll keep you posted. Let's see, there is some. Okay, did I miss any of the questions in the chat? I don't think so. I think somebody was just saying that they remember meeting you before in another point. Yeah. Danny, I have a question. Yes, please. Hi. So uh, you just mentioned all the uh, 
user feedback and uh, analytics that uh, analytics initiatives that you are performing at your library uh, what kind of tools softwares uh, is good to learn to use i know tableau is one of one of them but do you have more uh, what else should we learn yeah um what else should you learn good question um let me pull up a list real quick of some of the tools that we are using. Um, so I think um, tools like Miro and Figma are really helpful for um, brainstorming, for prototyping, um, things of that nature. You can actually do a lot of um, that work in the same kind of space, in the same kind of uh, canvas. Um, so you can actually take something from a landscape review over to your prototype um, into Fig in Figma. Um, I also love Jamboards. I learned today that Jamboards are going away. It's a great way to gather feedback from people. Not going to be around anymore. So yeah, definitely worth learning um, Figma or one of those other tools. Um, we use Site Improve for web analytics. Um, it's a helpful tool. It's not super hard um, to learn to use. Um, but I mean, Google Analytics, I think is still the thing that a lot of people do rely on. Um, Crazy Egg, I think is another one that we've used um, that does things like heat maps. Um, what else? Canva is helpful for like marketing. I think probably all are familiar with Canva already. Um, I think any kind of um, statistical software that you can learn to use is helpful um, in terms of how do you um, interpret that data. And that could be anything from R to SPSS, like whatever your favorite is, that's what you should use. Um, and you have access to, of course, that's important. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of user experience work is, again, like talking to people and um, yeah, I guess survey tools too. So Qualtrics, if you have access to it, Google Forms, if not, um, SurveyMonkey, things of that nature. Um, you don't have to be super fancy, I think, to do good user experience work. It's a great question. Um, okay, how do we get people to fill up? To, oh, good, good question. Um, well, uh, no one is more surprised than I am that QR codes have become a thing. Um, I remember like in the early 2010s being like, this is silly. No one will ever use this. And then the pandemic happened and now we're all using QR codes all the time everywhere. Um, that actually has improved our response rate. So yes, QR codes, I am sold. Um, promising people that it's short. I think that often helps. Um, we sometimes do surveys like stopping people as they walk by. Um, have some kind of prize there while they fill out the survey on an iPad um, because they really want that prize or they really want that thing. Or um, we'll have some kind of fun like stress relief activity, like do some Legos. And also here is a survey. Um, that's a moment that sometimes people will take the time to fill out surveys. Having surveys available at points where we know that people have strong opinions or pain points. Um, so we want to know more about what the experience is. Perhaps we know that people are unhappy with it, but we don't know specifically why. So making sure that the survey QR code is right there for them to give us that feedback. Um, for large scale surveys, we typically do um, like a big prize, right? Like five $100 gift cards. Um, people aren't willing to do surveys for a $5 gift card, which I understand because you know your time's worth more than that. Um, but we can't give $100 to everybody. So we wind up doing a raffle, but we do have pretty good response rates with that. Um, but yeah, in general, I think everyone has a lot of survey fatigue. Um, so really trying to find ways to make your surveys very to the point um, so that it takes people basically no time to fill out um, or making sure that you get all the information that you need at once so you're not going back and surveying them again and again and again and again. And then of course the problem with all surveys, especially like satisfaction surveys, is that you hear from the people who love you and the people who really don't love you, but not kind of the people in between. Um, so that's that's the challenge. Um, when I was doing a project for the UX class, we had to 
um, or maybe it was even from my marketing class. Like I was looking for reviews on my public library and similar, like what you just said, like you see people who love it and people who had one bad day and they, they decide to put one star because the book they didn't have was there, wasn't there, or something like that. Um, so it is very interesting how, and that's on, that's like on reviews more than surveys, but I, I think it's the same thing. You, you have to feel strongly enough to want to do, to want to fill it out for some reason. Um, totally. Another thing, I guess, that if, um, would be have people, or have you noticed a trend in positions looking specifically for UX related? Um, librarians, uh, I guess, since you've had this position, have you noticed that being something that other um, schools are looking for, or is it generally something that is expected regardless of your title? Yeah, that's a really good question, too. I think there was a boom in titles that included user experience, like user experience librarian in like 2012, 2014, and then that has really shrunk significantly, um, I think for two reasons. One, there is more of the expectation that people who especially are coming out of library school have some of those basic skills um, that they can apply to serving whatever their population is. So even if you're a subject librarian, you might be expected to have some user experience related skills. Um, but also that kind of work got folded into the assessment and evaluation kind of librarians, I think, um, which is interesting because um, that's more like looking at the final result often and user experience is about iteration. Um, but I think that, again, because of some of these external pressures of like showing the value that the kind of trendy job to post was the assessment librarian, but often that does have user experience components. I have not seen too many user experience librarian postings recently. Um, I think we are not unique in having a digital experience unit, but there aren't a lot of them. Um, and I, again, I think this part of the product of librarians are asked to wear many hats, and now this is another hat that folks are being asked um, to put on. Probably not good. I'm not for that. <laughs> Yeah, no, that that checked out to me. Because um, when you look at, um, you know, a position online, you look at them. Sometimes it is a laundry list of things that they hope that you will also be able to do, and you go, "Whoa, yeah. this is a lot of things." Um, uh, on top of of that, I guess, um, or I guess, what would you recommend to to somebody who is looking to looking at a position that would involve a level of that and i and i'm i guess i'm also asking it or assuming that because you're in a university that maybe there's more um room for research and iteration than maybe other places but I, I don't understand know if that's true like yeah um I, I think it really depends on the university um but I think it depends. It, it, the question to ask yourself is like, what is the thing that I really want to do? What is the environment that I want to be in? Um, so there are, of course, many user experience jobs in the private sector that are only user experience, right? Like that's all you do. Um, and that I think could be really fulfilling if that is the thing that you love. Working in the private sector, you don't have as good job security often as if you work in an academic library or even a public library. Um, so there's definitely trade-offs um, and just thinking about like, do you wanna work in an office versus a library or work remotely all the time versus working sometimes on site somewhere and interacting with a user population. So I think those are all things that are worth considering. Um, but yeah, I, I think I saw a, uh, question here about the tech boom and if I think that user experience related titles will continue to decrease. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that there are new job titles that include this role um, and again it's kind of like what is 
um, the thing that people are talking about at the time. So I have seen more things like accessibility librarian or accessibility specialist for libraries, which is very much related to user experience, right? Um, but has that focus on um, accessibility standards, for example. But you still have to do user experience kind of work in order to achieve those things. Um, we have, again, like a title of um, one of our librarians is the lead for inclusive design. The user experience role doesn't have that title, but it has an EDI framing, an equity, diversity, and inclusion framing. Um, so I think if you look at job postings, you will still see the core of user experience work there, but it's going to have kind of whatever the thing that academic libraries are paying attention to at that moment um, around it. I don't really know why that is, because user experience librarian is actually a good title, um, but it, you know, could be funding. Um, design thinking, totally. Design thinking is really a great thing to learn about. Um, systems thinking. I took a systems analysis class in library school. That was one of the most useful classes that I took in terms of practical application. Um, yeah, Christina. Yeah, I have a, um, the question that I had was just kind of, I was wondering if you could comment on your experience in, in academic libraries about working with vendors and how um, user experience is, um, and this kind of echoes what you just said, but um, how user experience kind of just echoes uh, what systems thinking is and kind of like presenting a cohesive system. I work in an academic library and um, in the systems department, and I was kind of surprised because th this this is kind of a new role for me. And um, a, but a lot a big part of the role is is presenting a lot of these different interfaces like through the Spring Share like A to Z list and like how do we make it look. Um, look cohesive and match our library website. Um, well, at the same time, you're accessing different resources and we don't control what the final web page looks like. And maybe you have a proxy, maybe you don't. And so there's like all of these little details that are presented as one system to the student, but actually like everything is managed to look that way. Yeah, Christina, what a great and insightful comment. Like you're totally right. This is one of the big challenges is that the library website itself is relatively small, right? It's all of these licensed databases that we go out to that have the resources, the um, integrated library system and the discovery system that you actually use to search all of the library resources, which is, I think, in no case that I can think of something homegrown at this point. Um, so it's all working with vendors. And one of the things that is interesting and drives me a little bananas um, is that the user experience like it's not easy in many of the tools that um, we purchase from vendors to customize things so that it does match our branding, so that it is accessible, um, that it meets our user needs, right? And like, um, it's like wild that our, some of the library vendors get away with that, right? So um, some of the major ILS vendors like have a pretty terrible user experience and then somehow it's our job to fix that. That's job security for people who work in libraries, but like, what are we paying for? Um, so, um, yeah, I think, are you all uh, ex Libra? You, you have um, Alma and Primo as your ILS at San Jose State, I believe. Um, but um, as part of the CSU system, there is a lot of work being done by CSU librarians and UC librarians to make that system better, not the vendor. Like, that's wild to me, but it's true. Well, um, Danny, didn't you say um, when we uh, were in that, I guess, mentorship Zoom meeting, you were telling me that one of the um, systems didn't work on mobile at all? I can't think of what it is, but I'm sure that's Oh, no, true. no, I wasn't asking for a specific <laughs> yeah. name, but it was just an yeah. example that you were saying that, you know, you went through the process of getting on board with this vendor and that um, they, their mobile system just didn't exist or didn't work. Totally. Yep. That would uh, not be uncommon um, that, you know, but they're the only people in the space, right? So like you don't have a lot of options. Um, so there's a limited number of ILS vendors for databases. If you really want that content, there might just be one vendor who provides it and they haven't updated their web interface since 1999. Um, like, not That's all terrifying. of them. <laughs> 
Um, so there's a lot of um, really cool projects to kind of address some of these issues. So um, if you've ever read an ebook or tried to access an ebook um, through the any library website, right? Like the experience is very different depending on the publisher that you're getting it from. Um, public libraries have kind of solved this by having some of these um, integrated platforms that convert the files from the publisher into one format so you know where the button is every time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, academic libraries currently don't have that, but there's a project called the Palace Project that's intended to do that um, so that any publisher will look the same to the end user. Um, you don't have to figure out you know, oh, this is a Cambridge book. And so I have to click here, here, and here, and it's gonna look like this, or this is an Oxford book and it looks totally different. Um, like that is a terrible experience. Um, but it, once again, it's like, it's up to the libraries to come up with a solution. Um, there's not the incentive there for the vendor. Yeah, that's actually something I struggle with all the time with our online library at SJSU is that um, a lot of the, in library digital reading, like digital textbooks are not very accessible for mm -hmm. vision issues. Yeah. So um, yeah, I definitely, I that integration I could definitely benefit from. And I know if I can, other people definitely could. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the idea of universal design, right? Like if you serve the people who have the largest need, you're actually serving everybody. Everybody will have a better user, user experience. Is there a universal user experience committee or any kind of like global, anything like that? I want to say yes, but let's see. Do they have their own? I think it's called CAST. Is it not what that is? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure, but it is like a global like loosely organized group, but I think that there is um a group that is specifically focused on universal design. I think there's also an interest group as part of ACRL on universal design. Is that right, Lauren? Do you know about that one? Um are there some good um are there any good book titles on universal design at all? Yeah. Um, let me see if I can get a title for you. Um, I'm totally going to blank on a book title. There is a good book from, I think it's ACRL as well. It's about universal okay. design and libraries. Um, I'm not going to come up with the name right now, but I mean, I guess you could always yeah. link to it later. I mean, I have, I think I have your email, so I can okay. always ask about it and have you okay. pull it up and then I can share it with others. Yeah, that would be great. If you wouldn't mind. Um, oh, I don't mind up, at all. I, that would be awesome. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah. Oh, yep. I see, Michelle, you have the comment about um, Sharesley's project on um, chatbots, which is so interesting, right? Like that's definitely going to be a growth area is AI and how that interacts with service delivery and teach, like all the things really. Um, yeah, it just, that's a whole new world that I don't think that uh, I personally will say I was not prepared for how fast that would move um, because I feel like it was November and it was like, what is this thing? Oh my gosh, like it's just a novelty. And now people are using it to like apply for jobs and write papers. And like, I was surprised yeah. to find out that lawyers use the chatbots a lot. Like it's an alternative yeah. to yeah. expensive legal services for a lot of people who can't afford to speak with an actual lawyer. Totally. Um, someone was telling me recently that they've been using it to um, ask for recipes because it will give you like a good recipe, but not all the like preamble stuff from 
blogs because it scraped all those blogs, right? So it has the recipe. It's like, that's pretty smart, but also kind of lousy for the people who created those recipes, right? Like they're not getting any clicks or ad revenue or whatever, but yeah, just interesting. I guess I found out the reason for that, why there's always like a long spiel before the recipe. And I read something, I don't know if it's true, but apparently you can't copyright a recipe. You have to, you can post it, but as soon as you post the recipe, it, anybody can use it. So, um, and profit off of baking it or making it or whatever. So people to make it stand out so that they know it came from them, put a bunch of other content in order to basically market the fact that it's their recipe and to copyright it. That makes a lot of sense. I would also imagine that if they're hired to do it, they have a word count that they have to reach. That's possible as well. It may be a content thing. Yes. I mean, I'm sure it's probably a combination, but like, like it's also possible that they do the cooking part, but they're not much of a writer. They hire someone to do it. They say, I need, I want someone to write me a thousand words. And they go, all right, got to hit that. Because I'm, I'm a, co- a copywriter and a lot of people do ghostwriting for different things. So, yeah, anyways. Um, very interesting in AI and ethics and all of that. We were just talking about that last week with um, Dr. Maradian. So, oh, nice, nice. Timely. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. More timely all the, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> um, let's see. I, did you? Uh, because, sorry, someone asked me a question. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Lauren. Uh, uh, Daniel, so you you spoke about all the exciting activities you are doing at the library about user experience. Do you would you like to share a, 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 one of the best success stories? Uh, I mean, just a positive outcome, just resulting from your uh, UX efforts. Yeah, actually, let me show you um, one of the new newly designed um, pages. So I think maybe one that I don't have like an image of, but I'll speak to, which um, was making the case for expanded 24-5 access to library spaces, something students had been asking about for a long time. They wanted more seating. Um, we only had like um, part of one floor open overnight and it would get very crowded and hot and humid, et cetera. Um, but actually um, building kind of the data based case for why we needed to expand that space, which would involve some additional staffing, um, things of that nature. Um, so making that case so that we were actually able to make that change, thinking through all the different pieces that would need to be necessary for that to be, again, a good user experience that was safe for students, um, that made them feel like they had what they needed overnight. Um, I think that was a big success for us and uh, nice to kind of take this idea that students have had for many years, understand more about kind of the specifics of that need and then be able to deliver it. That has been really exciting. Um, And then let me show you our new Ask Us page. So um, you all may have seen um, Lib Answers pages before. So the SpringShare product, it's based, it looks like a giant Q&A. Um, and we had a website called Ask Us or a part of our website called Ask Us that would take you to the Lib Answers platform. And from there, you could use the library chat. Um, you could use, actually, I bet if I go back to the Wayback Machine, you can see the before and after. Um, so, uh, people wouldn't necessarily know that ask us meant like get help. Um, and it had a lot of information on it. Um, so, uh, we recently, um, had a significant project that, uh, involved many stakeholders, again, speaking to students speaking to faculty, speaking to librarians, speaking to our circulation staff. Um, So this was led by our digital experience team. So let me share my screen here. Pardon my seven gazillion tabs. Um, So this is what it looked like before. So ask us, FAQs, the chat was a little bit far down. Um, It just had uh, popular FAQs, which were, I believe, based on 
um, our choices, like what we thought should be the most important ones and not necessarily the ones that had the most um, clicks, things of that nature. Um, and just kind of like not, not a lot going on, not necessarily clear like what you could put in this search box. So a, a really significant project where the most work happened on the gathering information side and then creating some prototypes and um, getting feedback and iterating. And so now it looks like this, it's called get help. It says, how can we help you? It gives you more explanatory text. Um, the FAQs are broken down into subject categories so that you can kind of tell more quickly, like, oh, I have a printing problem. Like, let me go there to find it. Um, and then what we learned through this process is that most people don't want to talk to another human anymore. Like, it's fine. Like, I don't have a problem with that. Like, people want self-service. Like, they want to find their answer that they need right now. And so our Ask Us or our Get Help page should reflect that, um, which is not necessarily how we'd been thinking about it before. So that was kind of a revelatory change um, for this. So of course you can still get help from an actual human being. We actually played with the idea of not including the phone number at all because most people, def like if they don't wanna talk to a human being, they definitely don't wanna call someone. And that like includes me as well. Like I never wanna talk on the phone ever, ever, ever. Um, but um, we did ultimately include it because we serve, um, a lot of different kinds of people and um, different generations and different usability and accessibility needs. So we did include it, um, but it isn't kind of forefronted anymore. Um, and yeah, and then just a little bit more fun. So there's the raccoons um, and explaining what subject guides are a little bit more. So customized guides as opposed to subject guides or research guides, guides which didn't necessarily speak to people in the same way. To, so we did a lot of um, testing of the, the different language choices. Um, so yeah, that I think uh, was a big change for us and it took way longer than you would have guessed, but um, I think ultimately a good result. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. That's yeah. great. I, I definitely have talked to people recently or in general about like um, wording, et cetera, being a uh, that, like it can make a difference on if somebody knows that this is the resource they're looking for or this is the you know like uh, it's easy to forget when you hang out in library circles what maybe is more or less common to the totally. the average user oh uh, well, let's see yeah like for example somebody was saying that um that their library decided to change uh like the they decide to to call different sections of the library neighborhoods like this is the fiction neighborhood this is the whatever neighborhood and that's a cute idea but you'd have to um in, like let everyone else into your good idea so people know what you're talking about um yeah that's a great point um yeah i think like even when we say like go to the stacks right like people are like excuse yeah. me where am i going like stacks of what so yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, I have a uh, question about uh, UX improvements uh, at the library. So, uh, whenever you are prioritizing a UX improvements, uh, can you uh, just think of an, an instance where resources were scarce and leadership? Uh, you were just, you know, you were facing the leadership, just convincing about how this UX efforts would be necessary for uh, for the objectives. Um, yeah, so resources are always scarce, I think. Um, like there's way more work than we could ever accomplish with the staff that we have. Um, I think once again, like I'm very grateful for being at the library where I am currently. Like we have a lot of resources. Again, I think the fact that like my position exists is an indication that user experience is taken seriously and that we do have people asking us to take on different projects um, and they're prioritized, but I can't really think of one where like there wasn't some level of leadership buy-in right now. Um, in other instances, I think I have experienced that um, and um, you kind of have a choice, right? Which is do I try and make the time to do this thing that I think is really important, but like the resources that I have is my time 
um, which is limited by like the number of hours in the day. Um, and can I make the case, right? Again, if there's data to draw on, like, you know, you can really see how this is affecting people. That is an effective way of convincing administrators or um, people in positions of more uh, positional authority, power who can resource you um, to engage with that work. And, and I've definitely done that before, um, bringing kind of more of like a, a story, right? A narrative about why this matters and why we should invest the time. But I've also been on the other side where it's a thing that I think really matters and I can't get the buy-in. And in the past, I've done that work on my own time. I would not do that anymore. Um, it's not worth it. And like, um, though I might really care about it, like there are things that like I really cared about that I did in um, previous jobs and like they're totally gone now, right? Like. Um, when there's turnover, like things change, of course, but all the uh, extra time that I took, like it didn't last, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you really wanna have that institutional buy-in so that it does have that lasting power, um, that it has the ability to evolve and not just disappear. Um, that's, yeah, I recently discovered something that I had worked really hard on had disappeared and like that was really, really sad, but it's because I did it myself, like, and there wasn't that broad buy-in to it. Can you comment on um, you and the the academic culture that you come from because you have like this position and you have been supported by your leadership? Um, what's it like interacting with um, with other professionals who kind of seem to have more more challenges? And do you have any perspective on attending conferences if you go to ALA or any academic specific ones? Um, what kind of what kind of feels feelings do you get from the field as a whole? and their approach to these things? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question because I came into this role in December, 2020, and I haven't been to very many conferences since then because of the pandemic. Um, so a lot of my experiences talking to other people who are doing this kind of work are from like a whole different job and a whole different world, basically. Um, but, um, I think that there's a range of resourcing. Um, a lot of the ARL, the Association of Research Libraries institutions, the big institutions tend to resource this kind of work well, invest in it, have positions that are related to it. Um, and I think those are, so UC San Diego is one of them. And um, I think it is our responsibility to create things that some of the libraries who aren't as well resourced can also use. Um, so publishing methodology or having open source um, code that people can adapt to their institution, um, taking our kind of larger clout with vendors um, and saying like, hey, we really need this. Um, and so continuing to talk to people who are at other institutions, some of which are actually the same size, right, of the institutions that I've worked at, but are in different parts of the country that are you know, really not well resourced and thinking about how we can work together um, and what are those things that we share that we can mutually prioritize. Um, I think one of the things I love about working in academic libraries is the cross-institutional collaboration. Um, and again, this feeling of we're all working towards the same goals and we may have different um, user populations and we may have different experiences and we may have different resourcing, but how can we work together so that we can all benefit? Um, and that has been great. Um, Twitter was a great resource for uh, making those kinds of connections. Don't recommend getting on Twitter anymore. Um, it seems like LinkedIn is maybe like starting to fill that space, but I haven't quite made the jump over there fully, but um, I'm sure there will be another social media tool that like takes that space. Um, I don't know what that is yet, but um, social media, was really helpful, especially like in 2020, like in staying connected to people and trying to solve problems together. Um, yeah, but I've been at really well-resourced institutions and really not well-resourced institutions and it makes a difference. And um, yeah, thinking about how we can all benefit from those places that are doing really cool stuff. So like NC State, I think is a really great example of that. 
in that they publish basically everything they do. Um, and uh, they have a really nice repository of their different projects. Yeah, I know. That's so sad. I really like Twitter, but it's over now. <laughs> yep. Um, I had a question. Yeah. For those that are resistant to the idea of user experience or can't see the value in it, what's how um what's your approach to convincing those people that it's a necessary process? Do you have that issue often or is that something you don't really um Yeah, so I think that's a good question. I think it's less prevalent than it used to be, um, but it definitely still exists. And then, of course, you've got the people who are like, I know best, right? Like, the way I want it is the way it should be. And, like, the people, other people who might be using it, like, they're just wrong. They just have to learn how to use it the way I want them to use it or engage with the service the way I want them to engage with it. Um, and then I think, again, like, data can tell a story. Like, are people... Um, actually using that or where are they going instead like having a journey map of how like they have to do a thing do they actually go to the thing you want them to go to no it's too hard right um, and putting together the argument for why meeting people in the middle that of course your experience is important and valuable as well we have to think about the people on the other end because we'll never be able to teach everybody to like be a librarian, right? Like that's not a reasonable expectation. Um, so it sounds like statistics are helpful when it comes to convincing some of the people that are resistant, like just showing hard facts. I think so. Um, and um, of course, a lot of times the feelings that people have are not like based on fact, right? It's their feeling or their professional identity or um, something that you can't necessarily um that they can't quantify and not that quantification is the answer to everything but i think sometimes saying like i hear you i i know why you um i can understand why you believe this let's also think about our users and i'll share with you what i know about them and let's see if that's a match right and if not how can we maybe meet in the middle and right I, Makes sense. you kind of mentioned this earlier but i i've heard from other library positions as well that it's that it can be one of the roles that you have to continuously like defend why it exists it was like like i spoke to a a school librarian that said that she's like i started in the 70s having to defend why you need a school librarian and i ended my career having to defend why you need a school librarian and it sucks but i not everybody really understands well, you know, until you bring out statistics sometimes, like what is the value of whatever that position is and what libraries can offer, and et cetera. Yeah, and I mean, libraries do so many different things and most people don't avail themselves of all the different things that libraries do. Um, so they may think like, there's nothing there for me, therefore it's not valuable. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, it is sad. Like libraries are a public good. There aren't very many things like them or maybe any things like them. Um, but there's no bottom line, right? Like we understand things in our culture in terms of profit and like, of course there's no profit. It's always going to be a cost center. Um, so in academia, for sure, like if you just looked at a budget sheet, you'd be like, oh my gosh, the library budget is a big part of our budget. Like, what are we getting out of it? Um, so, like, I understand why administrators want that information or have that impulse to, like, and so we have to meet it the best we can, um, but there are some intangibles for sure. Um, I, I know that, like, coming from us, like, we are a completely remote virtual school versus um, your environment, potentially, but... Um, I think of even just having that physical space of the library for students or anybody that wants to work as a free space to go spend time in, like that in itself, even if it was empty, I feel like is so valuable, like to have a third space to work that's not home, that's not um, an office, like 
I don't know, at least for me, like it's, it's, that's how I get a lot of my work done is to go somewhere that's not here to work. And um, I don't know if that's something that people talk about, but yeah. Well, I personally think that the public perception for whatever reason is that why should I go to a library or um, et cetera when I can just look on Google? And I, I think there's also a perception or like a stereotype that library equals physical books. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think I, that's always a challenge for me because people ask me pretty much every time I bring up that I'm getting a library degree is, you know, why? Why does it matter? Why do you need that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that is all definitely true. Um, and I think um, on university campuses, sometimes people don't understand even that the material that they're discovering through Google, like they're getting access because they're on the campus network, right? Like the library pays for that. Somebody decided that we were going to purchase that and now they have access to it. Um, but they never see it if we've done our job really super well, right? They they don't know. I think that kind of speaks to what Christina was speaking about earlier. Um, but yeah, I, I think like a, a existential question, right? Is like, what makes a library a library? So you can see the beautiful building behind me. Um, so the first two floors don't really have, um, books in them anymore. We have some compact shelving, but not a lot. And then floors four through eight still do have collections. We could empty out the space tomorrow and put in seating and I, guarantee you every seat would be filled but would it still be a library like what are the things that make a library a library is it the monographs is it the collections is it the special collections is it the expertise and skills of the people who work in the library or is it all those things right um like yeah i mean i think that's going to be kind of like the question of the next 10 years um is like what makes a library a library when although i don't know I think there's kind of a trend going back to the physical book. Um, I was just talking about that with someone and they like, they ascribed the popularity to TikTok. They were like, because people want to show what they're reading on social media and you can't show an ebook on social media. So people are getting back into physical books again. I don't know if that's true, but I thought that was an interesting theory. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's an interesting take on it. I just read somewhere today is that uh, the library is not a place, but it's a concept. And I really liked the idea of the library being a concept instead of just a physical place, because it's basically it's we're just talking about uh, somewhere you go for information. And it, that can be uh, virtual, in person, online, any on uh, VR. Basically, it's the, there are endless possibilities out there. Yeah, I, I love that as well, right? Because it's about um, access to information. It's about people yeah. helping create that access, building knowledge, helping you find it, surface it. Um, yeah, I love that. So, I mean, a building is a building in the end, right? But it's all the things, all the concepts, all the people that are like housed or not housed in that building that really make it what it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, yeah, definitely Michael Stevens has written about this as well. Totally, Michelle. Yep. I think that's the thing that like, like my brother does audio engineering or whatever. It's like people don't pay attention to a lot of things that exist until there's a problem. And then you're like, why isn't this working? You know, why is there no Wi-Fi? Why is whatever the thing is? And that's when people are aware. Um, but yeah, which is unfortunate, kind of. But and sometimes these are very obvious things that happen, but you don't just re you don't realize and and until it's it's missing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is true. What is the? There's like a saying this squeaky wheel gets the grease something like that so whatever is like the worst is what you're going to pay attention to but whatever mm -hmm. is like going fine you're just like oh like I don't even see it in some cases 
I had a teacher when I was in grade school that used to say empty wagons make the most noise. Hmm. I've um, heard that one before. So that's kind of a, a that, I feel like that kind of connects to the situation because it's like if the wagon is full of all the things that you need to make it a good seamless experience, you're not going to hear a rattling. But if it's missing something, then you'll hear the wheels moving. Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm -hmm. Um, is there um, any specific like uh, like place where we could like is there anything like channel that you can think of that we should be keeping an eye on that would be talking about current UX um, issues that or or any like topics that you think would be relevant for anybody interested to stay on top of things? Yeah. Um... I think like you all are probably really familiar with all the industry groups like Nielsen, Norman, things like that. So um, like their resources, I think are great um, and helpful for keeping up to date within libraries specifically, academic libraries specifically. Uh, Weave the Journal of User Experience is a great resource. Um, they haven't been around super long, but some really good articles in there. Uh, Core has a section that um, talks about these issues um, I am having a lot of trouble pulling the names of things right now. Um, <laughs> there is a conference that, um, is about, what is it called? Oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. All right. It's okay. I'm going to follow up on this one too. Um, yeah. Um, and, uh, they have a lot of sessions that are about user experience as well. Um, there was a conference called UX Y'all that was in North Carolina and Virginia for a while. I don't know if they've had any conferences in the, since the pandemic, um, but they had some great talks and resources coming out of there. Um, yeah, I think. Oh, I see, I see yeah. UX LIBS, like LIBS. Thank you. Know. Yeah, um, actually, I think. Michelle, you were the one who mentioned Sue Wei earlier. I know she presented there um, earlier this year. There's another one as well. And um, it's kind of like development and UX um, and cannot pull the name to save my life. Um, Adobe. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know as many people who are using Adobe as I did 10 years ago. And I think it's because of their new pricing structure. Um, so it used oh, to be like, yeah, that's rough. It's very expensive. It's totally expensive, right? And like you used to be able to like buy Photoshop or buy Illustrator or buy whatever you needed and then you like had it. But the new subscription model, I think has really limited the number of people who are using it. Um, and Figma is just a way more affordable option. Um, but yeah. I Isn't mean, Figma free up to a certain point? Mm -hmm, it is. Yep. Okay. That's awesome. Um, well, awesome. Is, does anyone else have any questions or, or Danny, is there anything that you feel you would like to cover that we haven't talked about tonight? Um, I just really appreciate getting to talk with you all. This has been fun. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. Um, and if there's anything that I can follow up on, please reach out. Um, I will actually put the link to my slides in the chat. I don't think I ever did that. Um, and uh, it has my email address on it, but my email is also dannycook at ucsd.edu. Um, and yeah, I mean, user experience in academic libraries is really fun and the community is really great. Um, and happy to connect you with anyone as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny.